Um, do you do you remember when you used to like used to be able to just like uh, change your Facebook status like through text? Like you could you could text your whatever your status was like to some automated number. Well, it would change your Facebook status. You have to remember, I did not have a proper cell phone until I graduated high school. So, okay, I might have missed that. Well, like this was like for whenever your phone didn't have like data. Oh, you know, like this was this was like like slightly pre iPhone taking off, you know, but like so you had a Facebook page and you wanted to update it on the go. And so you would text whatever you wanted your status to be to a phone number and it would change it on the website for you. No, was I was I was too busy updating my MySpace uh, music uh, selection with my Palm Pilot. Sure. Yeah. You know? Did you act? Did you actually have a Palm Pilot? I had like a knockoff version. Okay. I had a Palm Pilot. I know. Yeah. That's where I got the inspiration yeah. from. I was like, that thing looks <laughs> cool. <laughs> I fucking loved my Palm Pilot. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it had its like, it had its own. Um, sort of like language to be able to write on it so like you could sort of tap on the keyboard but then it also had like the um these two little pads where you could like draw in characters and then it would translate that into text but you couldn't since you couldn't it was like capacitive touch so you couldn't do like multi-tap and it couldn't remember um like multiple strokes so it was like a bizarro alphabet where you had to draw letters like Almost not really cursive, but like without taking the stylus off of the screen and only in these two little designated areas. And was this more efficient? No, okay. not, at all. <laughs> not at all. But it was how you would do it. I mean, it was once you got the hang of it, it was faster than like typing one by one on a little keyboard with the stylus. Mm -hmm. But you had to master yeah, it, it was like, yeah, it was like learning a whole new way to write, which was not ideal. Like you had to do certain like little loop de loops for certain letters. I remember the L was weird. Like it was like a, a you had to make an L, but you also had to do like a loop either at the top or the bottom. Wait, how do you type on the Zuckerberg goggles? The Zuckerberg goggles or the iPhone goggles? The vision. Or the Apple thing. goggles. The Apple one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The new thing. How do you type on that? Because it's a computer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that one is uh so that tracks your hands. Oh, it does. Yeah. So like you bring up a keyboard and you follow like your eye movements, go to the letter and then you like uh, tap your uh, uh, index finger and thumb together as the click. I hate everything about that device. Yeah. I Like the technology itself is cool enough that it like accurately supposedly can track your eyes like to like a specific letter and know that you're focusing on it. And the fact that it can actually track your hand without any kind of controller and like get that movement. That was on its own are cool, but the fact that you, that's how you have to type is awful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> just, yeah, just like, and you want it to be a, a usable like workspace is like, no, not at all. What do you think is more difficult, um, that um, typing situation on the Palm Pilot, or if you were to take your Vision Pro and walk down the street with it, trying to type up a like a, an email? I'm trying to think of... Okay, wait, am I on the street for both or just the, the iPhone thing? Just, yeah, no, the, you can be wherever you want with the Palm Pilot. Oh, I would rather do the Palm Pilot. Okay. <laughs> yeah, any any day of the week. I mean, I'd like to have a Palm Pilot right now. Like, like we kind of do. It just sort of morphed into the, the smartphone, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. But, but like there was something, oh man, I loved me a PDA, let me tell you. Uh-huh. Holy shit. Doesn't that stand for something different? Uh, It can, it can. I choose to ignore that, ignore that abbreviation. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to think if I was walking down the street in the Apple thing, whether I would hit a lamppost first or just like fall flat on my face and break that fucking thing. Like which You'd would be all soon? the better for it. I would be out thousands of dollars. Yeah, honestly, I hate this thing so much. You could give me one for free and I would not use it. Not even for a little bit? Um, for, for an afternoon, just, yeah. just, just for the novelty of it. And then I'm throwing it out the window because we do not need to go down that road with technology. Sure. Yeah. I just, I can't get over the screen on the outside. Oh, the one that shows your eyes. Yeah. That's got to add at least a thousand dollars right there. Yeah. Cause it's like a four, it's a 4k screen. <laughs> that one <laughs> it's is like a 4k screen. It's <laughs> incredible. Oh. <sighs> So like, you know, you know what? I don't want to get into this. We, we're not, uh -huh. we're not that podcast. We're not, uh, uh -huh. we're not that podcast. <laughs> You're not that guy, pal. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I tell myself. Hey, what's up? It's the Den and Roadshow. 
episode 85. I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking, right? So if you, uh if you take your vision pro to a baseball stadium, right. And you're watching, you're watching the game IRL. Yeah. Is there going to be an app that overlays like stats onto the field? Like you're watching like a TV broadcast, but you're actually there in person. I don't think naturally, I think you could pull up like you, you would open up Safari and then go to MLB.com and pull up the stats. Oh, that's terrible. No, because see, I would want it to align with the, like the, it would be on like, okay, so the batting average of the player would be hovering right above his head. No, you know, you would do the exact same thing that people on Twitter do. You would pull up whatever the, um, the Robo Ump app is that, and then it would just, so you could look up to see that that was a bad call. Yeah. But you would just have that like in the corner while you're watching the game at the stadium. Yeah, I don't like because you could just have your phone out then at that point. Of course, <laughs> any all these smart devices are like, oh, well, you could just have your phone. Yeah, that's like the that's like the same case for smartwatch. It's like, well, you could just have your phone there. Mm-hmm. It's like why I stopped using my half smartwatch thing. It's like, I oh, just me my too. Phone. I have a smartwatch and, and I've worn it like twice. Yeah, I mean, my thing was cool and it's like, but then the world shut down and I didn't go anywhere less like I went even less than I do normally. And then I never kept it charged because I wasn't going anywhere. And it's like, well, I just have my phone. <laughs> so what do I need it for? It's just another delivery system for notifications. And I hate those. <laughs> I feel like if if I think I've said this to you before off the podcast, but at least for me, if I can just minimize my technology use just in general, I feel like I'm better off for it. Sure. You know, obviously you have to use it in, in a lot of ways. Like we're, you know, we're recording right now on a computer and everything, but like, if just, just like not do any of the, um, the extra stuff, you know, and the, and the vision pro is the most extra thing that I've, I've seen so far. Yeah. 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 My toothbrush gets firmware updates. No. Yeah. yeah. See, that's, that's, I hate that. Uh huh. There's no need. Yeah. Yeah. Seems unnecessary. Are there like notes, like update notes for that? Does it tell you what? Uh, I'm sure if I really got into the change log of, yeah, my <laughs> Oral B toothbrush. Does that yeah, mean it's connected I, to the internet? It's connected to my phone, <laughs> which is connected oh, to the internet. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. So you have yeah. an app. Yeah, there's an app. You have a toothbrush yeah. app. I do. What's it here's called? The thing. I don't know. Oral B br- brush. I don't know. That's in the Play Store? Called. Yeah. You went to the Play Store deliberately and downloaded well, a toothbrush app. Yeah, to get the initial firmware update for my toothbrush. And so here's the thing. I've connected the toothbrush to the app maybe three times mm-hmm. ever because I don't take my to- uh, my phone to the bathroom when I brush my teeth. So it's never in range to connect to my phone. <laughs> Now, is that connection only for the firmware updates or are there other features? No, it'll like track your brushing and shit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. You know how you track your brushing? You buy a $2 toothbrush at ShopRite and once it's worn out, you know to dispose it and and get a new one. That's how you track your your brushing. I wanted an electric toothbrush. I went went overboard. Um, Can you, does it function? Like, can you use it without an initial like setup with the app and everything? I think so. I think it'll just turn on. Okay. But you don't curious. get the you don't get the latest and greatest. Yeah, I guess I guess you don't get all the modes. There's different modes, you know. For example, um there's the gum sensitivity mode. Uh-huh. I like that one. Okay. Uh there's the whitening mode where that just kind of goes harder, you know. Um <laughs> Yeah. Uh I'm not I'm not really going to try to sell anybody on this uh stupid toothbrush. So um, Our first yeah, ever like it, sponsored it, episode, everybody. Hey, if Oral B wants to hit me up, that's fine. Then I will. Then I will start selling a toothbrush. But um, yeah, like it, it's just like I. It's never in range for me to like see. It's like, oh yeah, you should be brushing here more or whatever it's supposed to do mm-hmm. because like my phone is not in the bathroom. Like because I'm brushing after a shower or at night, and I'm not like gonna take my phone in the bathroom just so it could sync up to my toothbrush you've had you know? um and it's well documented on this podcast you've had some some dental visits lately uh-huh um yeah. i had the toothbrush before all that by the way did you have you brought up this toothbrush to your to your dentist or the oral surgeon or anybody has there been any discussion uh no no the the, the dentist just recommended that i use uh, a soft bristle brush which meant that i had to buy different uh brush heads for the the toothbrush okay yeah I wonder if so these. The thing, I if, wonder if these are like a hot topic in the uh, the dentist uh, office. Apparently, dentists recommend the electric. I don't know how many. It's probably uh, if nine I had out of ten. Maybe nine out of ten. Maybe yeah, nine point five. Right. That's about right. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, but that's the other like supposed feature of the app is that it's supposed to remind you to change your brush head. I don't I don't like the amount of silence. Um, I just don't know what to say to that. I just I, yeah. I don't like it. I'm going to stick uh -huh. to my. Um, well, so this is, well, this the, is the, the biggest. This, no, the biggest decision I have to make with my toothbrush and selecting yeah. one is which color. Sure. That's the main thing. That's where it starts and ends. That's where the decisions begin and where they end. So here's the crazy thing. So I had to buy these sensitive. This is we've gone so far off the fucking rails on this episode. So so I had to buy this these sensitive toothbrush heads mm -hmm. on on the recommendation of my dentist. And so I was looking on Amazon, you know, because I wanted to get them as soon as possible because I had all these dentist appointments coming up. I want to impress my friggin' dentist. Um, and uh, so they they came in two different colors, and the one that would match my toothbrush was more expensive. Than the one that didn't. And I'm like, I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit what color it is. Exact is it, same is it the right functionality, right? For, yeah, it's a, is it the same product? Is it the same like bristles as each other? They are okay, fine. I'm fine. It does not need to match the color scheme of my my toothbrush. Well, just don't just let that, that, don't let that toothbrush in the frame on any of your Instagram posts because people are going to know that you are not fashion forward when it comes to uh, you know your toothbrush. Well, again, the phone doesn't go in the bathroom. Okay, and also you so, don't post anything on Instagram. So right, right, yeah. The last picture was a picture of my cat when he was a kitten three years ago, I think. So if anyone's curious. Um, we have some stuff for this episode <laughs> that was planned. <laughs> I told you I was going to riff. Yeah, uh, you said you could. You said you could riff. Oh, well, then I made the decision to riff, and I guess I didn't okay. vocalize that. I just kind of went well, into it. Well, you know, shit happens. Um, hey, we got a new segment. We got is a new segment alert. Um, it's a segment we've been doing, but uh, it's the part of the show where I talk about weird publishing stories that I find. And want to discuss, uh, and so I came up with a name. Uh, I'm just calling call it shelved. Um, I don't know how good that is, but uh, I came up with it uh, late at night, and I was like, "Hey, that's okay, maybe." And so shelved. This is the part of the show where I talk about weird publishing stories. Um, as long as it's just part of the show, show, and the entire show isn't shelved, because that that's also a possibility. Uh, uh we'll see. I don't. I don't think it's gonna be that long. Um, yeah, I do not have a sound drop yet. Um. So if if this is popular enough, I will make one. <laughs> I'm running out of buttons though. I gotta I gotta I gotta straighten that out. Um so uh I don't know if you're familiar uh with uh Elizabeth Gilbert. Uh she's the author of Eat Pray Love, um, which was turned into a uh who who is that? Is that Julia Roberts? Uh that sounds right to me. I think it's Julia Roberts. Turned into a Julia Roberts movie. Rom com, probably, right? Yeah, yeah. She like goes to India to like find herself is the whole thing, right? One of those. I think that's the premise. Sure. Um well anyway, uh she 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 has or had a new book coming out. Uh Julia Roberts she decided no, Elizabeth Gilbert. Okay. The author, the author, yeah. Um and but so she then decided to announce that she's canceling the new novel uh, because it was set in Russia. Uh, this is very weird to me. Um, we could actually listen to her statement about it. Yeah, let's do that because I'm to. confused. Hi, everybody. It's Liz, and I have an announcement to make. So last week, I announced the um, upcoming publication of my most recent novel, a book called The Snow Forest, that was set in the middle of Siberia in the middle of the last century and told the story of a group of individuals who made a decision to remove themselves from society, to resist the Soviet government, and to try to defend nature against industrialization. But over the course of this weekend, I have received an enormous, massive outpouring of reactions and responses from my Ukrainian readers, expressing anger, sorrow, disappointment, and pain about the fact that I would choose to release a book into the world right now, any book, no matter what the subject of it is, that is set in Russia. And I wanna say that I have heard these messages and read these messages and I respect them. And as a result, I'm making a course correction and I'm removing the book from its publication schedule. It is not the time for this book to be published. And um, I do not want to add 
any harm to a group of people who have already experienced and who are all continuing to experience grievous and extreme harm. Um, so that is the choice that I have made. And I've got other book projects that I'm working on and I've made a decision to turn my attention to working on those now. So I just wanted to let everybody know that and thank you very much. Any book set in Russia should not be published. Even a, even a book that, based on that synopsis, is actually critical of the Russian government. A book about people resisting the Soviet Union. Yeah, exactly. Much in the way Ukrainians are. But she says any book, no matter the subject, that is set in Russia should not be published. Yeah, it, it's, it reminds me of... Um, something that was happening a lot when this war first started, which there seemed to be um, like a mixing up of who's responsible for the war, uh -huh. right? Because a lot of backlash was being conducted against just Russian celebrities, people of, you know, noteworthy people who are Russian and, and not like specifically just the government, right? Because there's a very big difference between Russia and the Russian government that's enacting this, this, this war, right? Like that, those are two, yeah. two different things. Yeah. It's so what I think happened here, um, and I could be, I could be wrong. I could be very wrong. She says that she got uh, messages from her Ukrainian readers. I don't think they were readers. I don't think that they were uh, people that have read her work. I don't think that they are people who would have read her work if she had not announced this book. I think that they were people on Twitter and online with Ukrainian flags in their bios, uh, which means that they are uh, American neoliberals who have chosen this as their cause and have become like Ukrainian nationalists in the process. Uh, and as you said, take this like very xenophobic stance toward the Russian populace mm -hmm. as an extension of the Russian government. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's that's about right. I mean, it's kind of what you would expect from social media at, the, at this moment anyway. Yeah, because like if you go into the replies, it's lots of people with Ukrainian flags. Some of them have uh, actual like Cyrillic in their bios and, uh, you know, Ukrainian looking names. I, I'm, I'm not an expert on, you know, the etymology of names in the region, um, you know, like like thanking her for her decision and saying that it's the right decision and blah, blah, blah. And then you have people like genuinely asking, like, like, how is how is this? How is this helping? Like, how is this like easing any potential pain that Ukrainians might be uh, going through, because that like is the point that she's trying to address is like the fact that like her work might be causing hardship when that's the opposite of what she's trying to do with her work. Uh, and so many threads would just be like, well, uh, we're trying to suppress uh, Russians like like literally that's what they'll, they'll end up saying. It, it, this is actually like a campaign to uh, suppress Russians in the media. Yeah, like they, they 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 admit it. It, it they, reminds they say me, it. too, of in the early days of the Russia, Ukraine, this whole story, because um, we were sort of focused on like the hockey world as you know, as, mm -hmm. as it relates mm -hmm. to that. And um, some of the star hockey players that play in America um, are Temi Panarin, right? He's he, he's one of them. Um, Alex Ovechkin. It's like they were being removed from like sponsorship campaigns. And the argument there was by removing them from those campaigns and from the public eye in some way, that would be lessening um, like Putin's influence, right? Because that's something that Putin thrives on. Uh -huh. And like to me, that made more sense logically i don't necessarily agree with removing those players from from the sponsorships but i i understand the the mentality behind it um here i i just i fail to see it um especially when you look at again the synopsis of this book and what it sounds to be about and where this author is coming from when writing it and and all that i just don't understand I don't understand it. And and I'm also not right. Ukrainian, so maybe there's something I'm missing, but I, I don't know. Um, so here's a reply. Uh, we're going to wait until Russia isn't a bloodthirsty war machine bent on crushing its neighbors and destroying the West. So you think an October release, maybe? And then there's somebody uh, with a Ukrainian flag here. Uh, that's what we're all hoping for here, certainly. Maybe even no Russia at all by Christmas. I just see 
like people out for blood on the Ukrainian side here. Like they want to eradicate any mentioning of like there's no there's no actual issue with the the p potential plot of this novel other than the fact that it mentions Russia. And then at that point, what can you and not call even it? directly just the fact that it's Siberia, Ye which is so at that at know. that point, what can you call it other than xenophobia? Right. I mean, yeah, which is unfortunate. Yeah, it, it's 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 wild to me. I don't know. It, it, it's just it's just crazy. It's just it's just yeah, it's, it's people that would have never considered her book, known about her book until there was some kind of weird campaign online that says that, hey, this author is writing a book set in Russia. Yeah, a lot of these online campaigns, they start from like a relatively small group of people and then maybe they catch some media attention and things maybe start looking like it's it starts looking like a larger um, group that's like speaking out against something than it actually is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So like like I, I genuinely think like uh, Elizabeth Gilbert strikes me as the kind of person that really doesn't want any kind of conflict. Mm -hmm. And so she, she probably felt this was the best situation. Or, you know, or the best solution to the situation or rather. or maybe she was looking at all these um responses and she's like an empathetic person and she's like oh i'm actually uh hurting people here um let me right. let me pull this and and not really ask too many questions because people are clearly upset and i'm just you know it's not worth it it's not worth releasing it right and i'm not going to wade into some kind of geopolitical no no whatever mm -hmm. You know, like that's like that's the other thing. I, th I feel like there is a shield up where it's like you can't necessarily discuss this unless you're involved. But you also have to side with one of these world powers at war. It's like, man, no, this whole this whole thing sucks. Yeah, but no, this isn't even about world powers. This is just this is a, a book set in a place. I know. Right. But she can't even like she feels like she has to tap out. Yeah. She can't even do her thing. Yeah. You know? This like her book. Her book wasn't even set this century. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't even set in this century. But yeah, can't can't falter for it. Can't falter for it. At the end of the day, no. But like, I don't know. I, I I see like a lot of shit that authors get for like. Man, I saw somebody in the replies to another author, uh, like, and the author was like talking about how uh, like a passage in a Cormac McCarthy book like moved them because Cormac McCarthy just passed this week. And that person said, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned this so that people know that uh, he was a violent writer and so that people can avoid his books. I'm like, what the fuck are you? OK, fine. But like, that was not the point of any of this. Right. Like, if that's something you want to bring up, go ahead. Um, but yeah, why would you attach that to an unrelated comment? Like, that's, ugh. Yeah, it was just this weird non sequitur. Yeah. That has nothing to do with it. It's like, OK, fine. You don't like violence in your media, but it's like you don't have to make that anybody else's issue. There's lots of other things for you. You don't have to read Blood Meridian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> OK, <laughs> like, yeah, like it's it feels like. You're in a field of rakes sometimes. Like, I don't know. I don't want to get like too like you can't say anything anymore because I, I don't believe in that. But like, ugh, yeah, there's there's some shit out there. No, that's funny that you bring that up because there is um, a distinction there with what we're talking about. And then there's almost there's a very similar argument made by uh, let's just say other people <laughs> um, yeah. that are claiming that they're like, you know, being censored and can't say what they want to say and but the context is very different because usually right. those people are saying something that's like hateful or problematic whereas in this case there's like these false critiques being made and and like the like like there's um context being thrown on like pieces of art and and various things that really shouldn't be it's it it's like i'm sure somebody has said this so i'm not like gonna take credit for this but it's like ascribing critique to have like moral weight to it so it's like i don't like something so therefore it and the person who made it are like is a bad person so like cormac mccarthy wrote violence in his books so therefore he's evil and i don't like it or him right and so other people should avoid him too right rather like on the opposite side of things that you have people that actually say like you said like hate speech uh inciting real world violence you know like the starkly different. And their argument is they should have free reign to, to say and do all those those things. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
So I, I, on its surface, it sounds like it's it almost it's like you're creeping into to an argument that sounds like that, but it's wildly different. Right. You you have to you have to make that distinction because otherwise you sound like you're a washed up stand up comic. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say. I was going to say exactly that. Like you're like you're yeah. a stand up comic. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of this comes down to something that you've mentioned a lot on here, which is media literacy. Just understand, uh-huh. understand the context behind something before you really attack it. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Um, so we talked, uh, I don't know how many episodes ago about the grief book author, the, the self-published children's author who wrote the grief book for her children after her husband, uh, Dot died. <laughs> he he's well, he's not alive anymore. Um, and then she was charged with his murder. Uh, she had some very interesting searches on her phone. Uh, so she uh, just went through pre-trial. Uh, this is Corey Richens, I believe. Let me get the name right. That's right. I did get it right. I should have more confidence. Uh, yeah. So she's in pre-trial right now. And the judge basically was like, yeah, I can't. No, there's no bail because there's too much fucking evidence. There's, <laughs> there's too much evidence. You're, you're not going anywhere. Is that directly from the transcripts? <laughs> it might as well have been. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> there's too much goddamn evidence. Um, and one of the uh, more interesting pieces of evidence was uh, her phone records, which showed her what she was searching on her iPhone. And um, <laughs> some of these... Uh, if someone is poisoned, what does it go down on the death certificate as? Uh, what is a lethal period dose period of period fentanyl? What do the pe- this is far from the point, but what do the periods serve in a in a Google search? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know if she was searching uh, like with Siri or something, maybe or like a you know like a. AI, like a voice assistant that makes it even funnier to me if she was like to in me, her home like in her living room asking siri these these questions yeah uh can cops force you to do a lie detector test uh death certificate says pending will life insurance still pay question mark so she was an author right supposedly she should have like if she was going to be this bad about her search history she should have like written a crime novel alongside the children's book so that this this could all be like construed as research right you know we've seen that before yeah with the romance author yeah uh this one's very good uh, luxury prisons for the rich in america <laughs> <laughs> I think at this point she knew the jig was up and was like, okay, where's the cushy shit? Also, do you get to choose? No. Okay, I didn't think so. Well, I think, I think, I think like if you got a good lawyer and you like confess, you know? What? So the deal is life in prison, but it's this specific prison? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Like if you're, if your lawyer's good enough, yeah, you can kind of swing for that kind of thing. And if you got the cash, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, how to permanently delete information from an iPhone remotely. This one was probably a concern. This might have been uh, from her laptop or something after the feds already had the phone. And also it, it didn't work. <laughs> it did not work. It did not work. Uh, and then FBI analysis, of, and she spelled analysis wrong, of electronics in an investigation. It's all just very funny. Uh, yeah, so she she's not going to make it. No, she'll be fine. She's going to luxury prison. Well, you know, yeah, the, the luxury prison thing is just very good. Uh, yeah, there was there was testimony from uh, her husband's sister, all kinds of shit. She's she's dead to rights. She apparently tried to kill him before this. Yeah, yeah, they got her. <laughs> they got her. <laughs> I'd say so. Need one of those. Uh, was it Tor browser? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. People, people's opsec is really bad. I don't know what to say. Even um, what's her name? Uh, I just watched that movie. Um, Reality Winner used a Tor browser. Oh, okay. Yeah, didn't didn't help in her specific situation, but she did. She did use sure. one in other instances. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, half of the shit on the dark web is just like federal honeypots, anyway. So I would not know. Yeah, they just they just like set up. It's like <laughs> they set up shit on Tor, like just really shitty sites that are just like. Uh, hitman for hire, like will kill wife, you know, wow. and then some dipshit just is like, yeah, I'll pay Bitcoin, whatever. And then the, <laughs> then the feds just show up at his door like, hey, how's your wife? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just it's just really, really obvious shit. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, we got some more book stuff coming up here. 
So last last time we mentioned we were going to do a book club, and uh, I just needed to pick one out, and so I did that. Uh, I don't have a I don't have a snappy name for the book club yet. I apologize for that. Um, but the but the pick is the Paul Bears Club by Paul Tremblay. Uh, he's written Headful of Ghosts, one of my favorites, uh, and The Cabin at the End of the World, which was quite recently turned into a Shyamalan movie. Um, and don't worry about how I originally spelled Shyamalan in the notes. So let's not let's not dwell on that. Uh, <laughs> Have you seen the adaptation? Because I wasn't even aware that that's what it was based on. No, yeah, because they changed the name. Knock at the knock at the cabin door or something like yeah, that. Yeah, which is a, a much worse title. But I guess they wanted to not confuse it with the cabin in, in the woods. Oh, right, 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 classic. Or some other kind of movies with similar names Mm -hmm. um no i don't have an interest because i heard that they changed the ending completely and then when i heard what they changed the ending to i yeah no i'm good (laughs) i'm good so uh the cabin makes them old uh no not quite no okay no no but yeah if anybody's seen the movie i would recommend reading the book because the ending is very different uh the, the plot setup is the same but the the ending is quite different so you would get a very different experience, I think. Um, but yeah, other, other than that, I cannot speak to the adaptation. Actually, I don't think I've seen a Shyamalan movie, now that I think about it. Same. Yeah, I mean, like, I know I know the plot of The Sixth Sense because that was, like, you know, spoiled to hell and back 15 years ago. Yeah, I was spoiled on that, too, but it's been so long that I actually forget. And so I could act, I could watch that movie uh, and and not know what happens because it's... Well, there you yeah. go. Um, yeah, this is his... Uh, latest novel. Uh, I've I've read a couple chapters so far, um, and so we will discuss that when we've both finished it. I suppose. Uh, uh, don't you want to hear about uh, what I have to correct from me ranting in the last episode? Um, I do, but before that, can we give a synopsis of the book club pick so that there's maybe just a, an outside chance someone will want to follow along? Oh, sure. Do you want to do that? Well, I don't have it in front of me. I actually haven't purchased the okay. book yet. Um, I th- Okay. I <laughs> gave it, you asked for it ahead of time so you could get started. Well, I need to get a physical copy, right? Because if I'm going to do this uh, right, I'm going to have to bring out the post-it notes. Okay. All right. So, and I couldn't have one shipped right away because I won't be home. Right. So I'm going to have to go to like a bookstore. Okay. But you're a few chapters in, so I think you can you can take over. Um, yeah. So Paul Bear's Club, uh, it is a fictional memoir of a character that we know as Art Barbara, and chapters are written as his manuscript for the memoir, and then broken up by uh, as of a couple chapters in somebody else that knew him uh, giving their notes on his experience that he's writing about. And their notes on the manuscript itself. It's it's a little like House of Leaves in that sense, in that you sort of have a main character's narrative that they're relaying to you, and then you have a, a separate character's uh, meta commentary on top. Of oh, it. this is what happens when you make the pick, huh? Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I didn't know that that was the uh, that was the case. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it's about, uh, so he, he's a high school guy in the eighties and he starts, uh, this thing at his school because he needs college cred or whatever application material. And so he starts a thing called the Paul Bearers Club, which is, uh, he's going to round up some people from high school and go to, uh, funerals for like homeless people or like old people that don't have family anymore and attend their funeral and also like carry their casket and shit and uh that's that's sort of the setup and since i'm only a couple chapters in i can't really like i literally can't say anything else because i don't i don't know anything else also if you so. if you are listening and you follow along and 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 read the book and everything you can use this book club for college cred uh you can see how that goes yeah i mean it can't be can't be worse I've never heard to it referred to as credit. Is it like an 80s thing? No, I can't remember what it was called. Credits? Application material? 
Like no, like what? Like to like boost your college resume? Like what was it called? Oh, oh, so it's not actual credit. No, no, like because he's in high school, so like. Oh, you're saying like credibility? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I was okay. Okay, I thought you were just like saying a cool version of college credit and like what? No, like uh, uh, extracurriculars. Yeah, 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 yeah. Words, words, no good sometimes. Podcast bad. Oh, podcast bad for sure. <laughs> podcast bad. Podcast very bad. <laughs> I needed like I needed like a preseason or something, you know. I needed I needed, I needed training camp for the podcast. Uh, like Aaron fucking Rogers here. Okay, I'm just gonna hit the Moogle button. I'm just gonna hit it. I needed the long version of that for this one. <laughs> I needed the long one. You know, maybe we should just take in the week. Yeah, you know, it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should just take in the week. I've been like, oh, fuck up the schedule. Oh, well. Oh, whatever. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm sorry. This is going to be lots of Persona 3 remake updates, even though I just put out an hour about Persona 3 remake. But there's lots of more information that I have to I have to relay to all the people that are just dying to know, and they can't get that information anywhere else much faster than a weekly podcast <laughs> well they say games journalism is dead so <laughs> not in here it's not okay so uh there are more screenshots and the japanese trailer uh released and it shows a much darker atmosphere and color palette and lighting than is in the english trailer or the one that was released by atlas west because there's no dialogue so this is one uh, major issue that I brought up that is sort of alleviated in my mind, at least. Um, so it just seems like they brightened things a bit, maybe just for visual clarity for the Xbox one. I don't know. But yeah, like the, the, the screenshots, the Japanese trailer. There's also uh, another like it's like five seconds that shows Tartarus the dungeon. And the corridors are much, much tighter like they are in the original and not so spacious, which was my other major gameplay concern. Um, so, yeah, like I jumped the gun on some things, but it was just sort of like a first reaction sort of, you know, kind of thing. Uh, one thing I do want to correct is that I said that it was in the same engine as Soul Hackers 2, and that is not the case. Uh, I went and double checked. Soul Hackers 2 was in Unity uh, and Persona 3 Remake is in Unreal. Uh, SMT5 was in Unreal, but as far as I know, this was the first time that P-Studio has used Unreal. Uh, the trailer has a new song for Persona 3, and if you use YouTube captions, it indicates that the song is called The Meaning of Armbands. And so all the characters do have their armbands for the special, uh, what is it, the special uh, extracurricular execution squad. So... There you go. Um, speaking the game of, has an speaking entire, of extracurriculars. You know, we should extracurricularly shoot this podcast. But the, the game has uh, an entirely new voice cast. And this was half surprising. So this means that all the dialogue is being redone. Um, probably most of the text has been rewritten. We don't know if anything has just been like saved and just brought over. Um, but this had to be the case for at least one character. Uh, Junpei's original English voice actor is a piece of shit. Um, he's like the most uh, infamous piece of shit in um, like anime dubs. So he would not have been brought back. Um, and there's something I can't I couldn't confirm this, but apparently Igus's voice actress is also like a weirdo anti-vaxxer. Um, and so none of that matters anyway. So they have a whole new cast. Uh, it seems like a lot of young people, uh, which makes sense, like they're playing high schoolers. But I, I think this is also like, um, I, I don't want to say less experienced, but like like younger, younger uh, voice talent, um, I want to say. Um, I, I, I'm not as up on like, uh, you know, like anime and games voice acting. So I can't I can't really speak to that any more than that. Um, but like just from like their headshots and what they were, were promoting online, they just seemed like a very, a very young crew. Uh, altogether um uh so the the major thing the major thing that we were all worried about and it's what i talked about very extensively last week uh was the fact that the 
is is this only base Persona Three? Where is the answer? Where is the female protagonist and portable content? You know what's going on here. We kind of need some answers on that, and we have them mostly. So there was an IGN interview. Games director and producer made some remarks about that. So they said that content from FES and portable is not included. So that means no answer, no epilogue, no female protagonist. But at the same time, they said that there are new events and scenes and that they added elements in from FES. And they they mostly said FES. They did not really say portable. But it seems like they're also preserving some of the social links from portable. And you kind of... You, you really need to. Um, but this is this is a it, it's this still sucks. And I said that I would rant about this whenever this was confirmed because it looked like it would be confirmed. The fact that this is going to be a remake of a game, but not the definitive version of that game just sucks. The, the issue with Persona 3 is the fact that it's split up like this. And if somebody wanted to play it, legally whatever emulate whatever buying this the 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 new ports that just came out uh for portable uh they still would not get the full experience of persona 3 and you're remaking the game from the ground up and people are going to play this game for probably the first time and that's still going to be the case where they're not going to get the full persona 3 experience and that's that just sucks. It's a huge, it just huge does. missed opportunity. It really is. And people are saying, well, DLC, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Persona games don't have important DLC. They don't. Unfortunately, what Atlas does with Persona games is they release the game. And then a couple of years later, they release another version that has an expansion and changed elements to it. They've done this for three mainline games in a row. They've done this with three. That's what FES and the answer are. They did it again with Portable, basically. They did this with four and four Golden. They did it with five and five Royal. They did not release... like the, Five and five Royal came out during the age of DLC everything. Royal was not DLC for Persona 5. It was sold as an entirely new game. And their excuse for that was, was because it wasn't just the additional semester... It was content added throughout the entirety of the game, and so it would be difficult to patch or some shit like that. Um, Meanwhile, if you look at the development timeline that Atlas has confirmed, basically, they started working on Royal like as soon as Persona 5 finished development, not even when it shipped, when it finished development. So they're going to do it again. They always do it with Persona. There's going to be Persona 3 Reloaded, FES, Portable, whatever the fuck edition, whatever weirdo JRPG name they slap on it that will have the answer, that will have the female protagonist. The difficult thing with the female protagonist is is that she changes the entire route of the game, and I feel like that's why they didn't do it. The answer is the more annoying thing because that's just literally an epilogue tacked on to the end of the game. It's an entirely different... It's it's basically an entirely different playable game, and that's why in Persona 3 FES Edition, you could just select it from the main menu and play it. So the fact that that isn't included is fine whatever, and the fact that it probably won't just be DLC when they eventually develop it, because they will now that they have this base for this game in particular, is going to be very frustrating. It's going to be very annoying. The fact that they will sell an entire at least $60 game, but we're now in the $70 game territory. I wouldn't be surprised if this is Atlas's first $70 retail game. Uh, It's going to be very annoying. It's going to piss off a lot of people. People are already pissed off. And these are the people that are expecting it to be a DLC when it won't be. I fully expect it to not be a DLC. Um, It's just, it's based on the track record. Like they have never, they have never, like all the Persona DLC has been cosmetic and like, optional bullshit overpowered personas 
They do not. There's nothing substantial that is released as downloadable content for the game. Well, what about like a uh, Persona Three remake royal version? No, that's what that's what I'm saying. That's what they're going. So, to are do. you also suggesting skipping this initial release? I physically no, can't. you can't. I know you can't. But like for the common you know player, it's too uh, early to say that. That's not that's not a fair question. It's yeah, too, it's too early. It's too early. Like if you just go based off of their track record, then it's a it's a fair mm-hmm. bet. You know. Like if somebody was doing a prop bet on this, yeah, I would take that bet. It's not like both games are out because right now because like you, you could look at Persona 5 and, and Persona 5 Royal and you could say you can make the argument to for someone who hasn't played either one, just play Royal, right? Um, yes. But we're, it's way too early to even suggest that here. Right. Because the first game isn't even out yet. Right. But that's the thing is if this if they're saying they're already utilizing elements from FES, which were a lot of quality of life, uh, additional social links you know, some other stuff and from portable, which would the main content from portable would be social links that weren't there in the original release and some other story bits. If you're already adding that in, then why not just tack on the answer? Like what it's, it's literally an epilogue. That is what DLC expansion shit is for. It's, it's for additional content to a game, but I just know like, there's nothing else that could be added to the game. Like to warrant a new re-release version that would need additional quality of life or like every time they do this, they like add a new character in a new semester and all these kinds of other shit with Golden and with Royal. But there's nothing to do that for for this game. Right, because like I was going to say as well, Persona 4 uh, Golden, Persona 5 Royal, those are both the second iteration of of those titles, right? But this is yeah. already like what we're getting next is a second or not even the second. It's it's there's been many versions of Persona 3. So this right. is already a remake. So it's like to to not double dip but go three times in if they're going to do that. If they're going to go down that road. Right. And that's the thing. Like they don't they don't release like they didn't release Persona 5 saying, yeah, in a couple of years, we're going to be releasing an entirely new version for $60. Mm-hmm. They're not going to say that. They've never said that. And that's the frustrating thing because there will be a lot of people say, yeah, I'll just wait. And that's fine. You know, but like it is frustrating because this in particular is the most makes the most sense for a paid expansion out of any any sort of update they've ever done to a game. Well, for starters, it should be there in the first place. I'm, I'm not going to let that mm-hmm. go. It should be there. But since it's not, it should absolutely be dlc after it's done being developed well it'll be interesting to see how they justify it right because like you said with with royal you have stuff that's built into every part of the game like from the outset you can tell that this is this is somewhat different somewhat different experience all the way through um right. but if they're just tacking that on you can't justify it that way so right. i don't know um and so uh it was confirmed that it's coming out for ps4 ps5 all the Xboxes, PC, uh, no Switch, and so that Spanish retailer that had the placeholders with all the all the game consoles uh, was was just that it was just placeholder. Uh, so no Switch, uh, but uh, Persona Five Tactica is hitting all of those same platforms plus Switch. Um, and so this is this is curious to me because um, I was like, oh okay, they couldn't make Soul Hackers run on the Switch either. So they probably can't make this run. But then I double checked and Soul Hackers is in a different engine than this is. And they forced they forced poor SMT5 to be a Switch exclusive on the 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 pitiful little Switch when that game was begging to be on a real platform that could actually render the draw distances and render the 3D demons properly. You think it will be eventually? I hope to God it is. I really do. Like it seems like they're prioritizing multi-platform mm-hmm. now. And the reason why they're doing that is because of Persona 4 Golden on Steam. If it didn't sell as well, they were like ready to abandon any kind of multi-platform. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Like that was them testing the waters. Otherwise, everything would be on PlayStation. Yeah, that's great because then now you have the Game Pass, uh, you know, you have Game Pass incorporated into this. You have, you know, yeah. I mean, the more platforms, the better. It's just very funny that Microsoft pays Atlas, however, whatever they're getting paid for like three-day exclusivity on the announcement like not on the game on the announcement of the game it's it's literally 72 hours for them to be able to say that it's coming to playstation and pc yeah it's crazy (laughs) like hey take the fucking cash um so there was still one surprise at the xbox thing 
Uh, so Project ReFantasy, which we have known about since... I thought it was 2018. I actually had to go back. We've known about it since 2016. Uh, was, I guess, reannounced with a real trailer, real gameplay. It is now Metaphor ReFantasio, which is the most jrpg s fucking name. Uh, it's directed by uh, Katsura Hashino, who was the director of P3, P4, and P5. Uh, art by Shigenori Soejima, who was the like main Persona character designer. Uh, who he, he worked under uh, Kazuma Kaneko, who was like the the main SMT demon designer for many, many, many years, and was also an early uh, Persona artist. That wasn't his job title, um, was it? Demon designer. Actually, yeah, oh, well, kind of was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is uh, a character in Persona. Uh, I don't know if he's in Persona One, but he's a character in Persona Two in the Velvet Room, like as a sort of a cameo as the demon painter. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, and music by Shoji Meguro, who is the Persona composer. Um, and so this is from Studio Zero, which is the team that uh, Hashino formed in Atlas after he left P Studio. So after Persona 5, he left P Studio and formed this team within Atlas. Um, and so he's no longer in charge of the Persona games. And they announced they were sort of like this was going to be their return to a fantasy RPG. Um, and we haven't seen anything about it since basically 2016, whenever they announced like a single visual and that this was like its project name, Project Re-Fantasy. Um, and this game looks fucking insane. It basically looks like fantasy persona. And like with this like talent at the top of it, like, yeah, of course, you know, mm -hmm. um, and Basically, what all of this tells me, the Persona 3 stuff, Persona 5 tactics, and the fact that you have, like, the main Persona character designer, you got the Persona composer working on this as well, which we did not know. We did not know that, that they were working with Studio Zero as well. Persona 6 is not coming anytime, anytime yeah, soon. Yeah, it's a safe bet. It can't. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no way. There's no way. Like, there's obviously lots and lots more people working at P-Studio, but, like, I, I don't know how true that rumor is, is that they split the team to work on half, half three, half six. I, I feel like they, they're, they have to be full hands on deck for three, unless they like really grew the size of the team. Um, but yeah, just the fact that they have like basically these three, they're basically executives at this point working on, well, Tashina we already knew was gone, but these, these other two, like, uh, Maguro, he, he is the one he mainly does the com compositions for all the music in Persona, but he also directed um, Persona 3 Portable, and he also directed... I want to get that right. No, he directed... Um, yeah, no, it was Portable and also the PSP ports for Persona 2, and I believe Persona 1. I think he did all the PSP shit as the game director. Um, so the, f the fact that like these sort of like executive figures from P-Studio are just like off doing this fantasy persona game because just based on the menus the art like the the enemy design uh the like i said the ui design it, it's a persona mm -hmm. game you know like in in all but the crazy ass jrpg name and the fact that it doesn't have like smt demons and smt spell names it, it's a persona game like does this yeah. does this excite um, you about as much as a persona 6 would uh it's not the same level but it's it's as basically as close as it can yeah. get Especially the fact that it's coming next yeah. year. Yeah. Like if this was still like some kind of far off like fairy tale thing, because that's basically what we knew. Like we had no idea if this was even still happening. You know, like we just had no fucking clue. We had no idea if Hashino was still even with Atlas. To be honest, we had heard nothing about that game. Hey, after that Overwatch news, um, I know it's a totally different studio and stuff. After that Overwatch news, who knows what, what to believe anymore, right? Pretty much. Like they can just scrap pretty scrap much. a project and keep promoting it for two years. Yeah, like we like we hadn't heard shit since 2016 mm -hmm. about it. Um, that was like 15 years so ago. Might as well have been. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's very exciting to see like a new like sort of IP from Atlas. Uh, like it means they aren't playing it safe completely. Like even though this is like very known talent and sort of a known direction, um, it's still it's still somewhat of a risk. Like they have to plaster everywhere that like this is from the makers of Persona Five. Yeah, you know, new like IP. To try to get people to pay attention. New to IP it. is always a but risk. Yeah, like new. Yeah, new IP. You know that name is fucking ridiculous. <laughs> but like, 
you know. Um, but no, it's 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 quite exciting. Uh, we don't know what platforms that's going to be on. I don't think. Probably a safe bet to say, you know, the current gen PS5, Xbox series. Probably, but but that hasn't been confirmed yet. And that just like that, you know, that strikes me as a very late 2024 game mm-hmm. if it mm-hmm. hits. But like I discussed last time, they don't they don't fuck around with release dates anymore. So. Um, but that does that if anything seemed like it was going to slip, that is probably one that's going to slip. Um, and mostly because the last Hashino game that took forever was Persona 5, which got delayed a bunch. So it wouldn't be crazy to see it slip till 2025. I don't know. I'm just I'm just guessing. I, I have no idea. Um, but yeah, all in all, still very good news. Uh, it it the details eased some of my worries. Um the the answer thing is just still very frustrating. The fact that the game is still split is very frustrating. Um, but I liked more of what we saw of the actual game itself rather than my like initial skepticism at the leaked trailer. So um, I, I just wish that they wouldn't hide like everything from the Western audience still, especially now that they're doing these simultaneous releases. It's like, Okay, well, show us the real, tr- show us the, show us the non like saturated like um, overexposed trailer. You think like, that's show like us the real colors? Do you think please? that's like market research or something? Like what works for Western audiences Maybe. when they're revealing games? Yeah, I don't know, but like this is like like I said before, like Persona is still such a niche mm-hmm. thing with like such a hardcore fan base that you have so many people that were like me just pouring over every second. And being like, I don't know, these colors do not look right. Well, and then you then you see the other screenshots, and you're like, oh, okay, this looks this looks real. Yeah, but again. the neat, like the the, the so hardcore like, people are going to be there regardless. So if they're trying to change the aesthetic a little bit in the showcase to make it more broadly appealing, like that makes sense to me. It's misleading. Yeah, then, it's misleading, like, but it it just makes sense to me. But then, like you know, two games later, they bring Atlas back out for. Metaphor Refantazio, which is a non-translated trailer <laughs> for the most batshit JRPG. Ever. Well, then I have no idea. Yeah, but like, no, you're right. Like, that's like that's like what they did. But I just I just don't see the rationale. Like, still, it's like it's a very antiquated mm-hmm. thing. It's like back whenever they would change Sonic the Hedgehog, like his different poses and like making him more chibified for like Japanese audience and giving him like more attitude for the American one. Just because of like character perception. Yeah. Um, well, this this is different just, different from it from just aesthetic specifically. But remember the original Watch Dogs reveal? There was like a whole gameplay demo that was far and just just so beyond any anything the actual game and itself ended up accomplishing. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Yeah. So there's always stuff like that at these like E3 esque things. Right. But that's why it's like okay, like I had to like go over the trailer. Like okay, you know, like what what is actually going yeah. on here? Like. But anyway, um, <laughs> I think that's enough. <laughs> Did we have anything else? I don't think we had anything. Else. I think we have to shelf this one. I think we do too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Really appreciate it. I don't know how much I can salvage out of this. Uh, and um, yeah, check out the uh, check out the Kofi page. Check out the Facebook page, which I gotta give the keys over to. And, oh um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna utilize that. Yeah, I've been saying it. Yeah, I'm gonna actually Keep gonna actually it. do it though. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know you can put you can email. put polls up on on Spotify now. By the way, put polls. Yeah, so I, I there's a podcast that I subscribe to, and when I clicked on the most recent episode, um, underneath it was a poll, like a user poll uh-huh. that you could answer. Um, huh? You know, our Spotify metrics might be our worst out of anybody like out of out of out of all like where we're any platform we're on spotify might be well there was that period where i listened to the show and i wasn't on it and i was on spotify okay you know maybe i have it backwards spotify might actually be the best there we go um they might just be yeah they might be blocked it's a whole thing i don't need to get into it um but also uh so apparently our our second biggest demographic uh behind the united states is uh singapore (laughs) rush No, no. Um, but yeah, if you're listening from Singapore. That's really uh, cool. Hi, what's up? Yeah, I, I don't know where the hell you found the show. I don't know how the hell you found the show. I'm glad uh, you did, though. But I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I don't know how the fuck you make it through. 
the fuck you make it through this but i appreciate it i don't uh, yeah i don't know where where the hell you found the show um but yeah thank you uh what else uh check out the youtube all episodes clips streams whenever we decide to stream all kinds you of know it's stuff. possible i was um, using a vpn when i listened to the show you're using a singaporean no, vpn I, I no, I think so. okay yeah yeah it, it's it's weird we like it says 13 percent of our audience is from singapore i don't i don't understand we are a global force yeah i don't i don't i can't fathom how anybody from singapore could possibly have seen this show and been like oh yeah this is the one no i can understand it because there's some niche stuff here you got your your persona uh talk which happens quite often you have um mm-hmm. if you know if you're, if you're a max bemis fan we have that covered for you um you know the, Irma Vep. if there is a max Irma bemis Vep. fan in singapore yeah. i'm just gonna start yelling we're Irma covering Vep that every venn week. diagram mm-hmm. yeah Irma, yeah that'll be that'll be like the if you can spot all the Irma Vep mentions mm-hmm. You know, for a month, you win a prize. I don't know what it is. I'll give you something. If you give me all the timestamps, I'll give you something. That just sounds like kind of ominous when you put it that way. Does it? It's a little weird. I don't know. I'll send you a book. How oh. about that? You'll get our book club pick so you can follow them all. <laughs> I was going to give him a Dead and Road book, but okay. Oh, oh, I see. I see. You're going to give him a children's <laughs> book? Why not? We're in stock. <laughs> Oh, what a shit show. Um, yeah. Not the book thing, but just this, this episode. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think my keep this one buried on the, on the drive. I don't know. <laughs> We're still recording, huh? What's, we're still recording. What's great is that uh, you're going to like keep apologizing for like six hours tomorrow. Tomorrow? No, I won't apologize once yeah. now that you said that. Okay. Okay, good. 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 Oh, you say six hours because it's how long the drive is, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. All right. Um, we should stop. Yeah. All right. Bye. <laughs>